Welcome to today's webinar about esophageal dilation featuring Dr. Diana Snyder. My name is Jennifer Roeder. I'm a communications consultant for AtFed and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We are pleased to have Dr. Snyder join us today. Dr. Snyder is an assistant professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Her research is focused on esophageal disorders, including eosinophilic esophagitis and motility disorders. She's currently running clinical trials in eosinophilic esophagitis at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Snyder. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to Jennifer and to the AFID team for inviting me to present today. Um, let me get my shared screen set up here. So thank you again. As mentioned, today I'll be discussing esophageal dilation in the setting of eosinophilic esophagitis. And we'll talk about several entities related to this. Really, what are the pros of it? What are the cons? And then finally, how as physicians we use it to best help our patients in treating EOE. Here are the objectives of what I'll be reviewing today. So first I'll provide some general background on eosinophilic esophagitis. I'll often be referring to it in shorthand as EOE since it's kind of a, a mouthful. In addition, um, who develops strictures in EOE? And then talk a little bit of what we currently know about why strictures form in EOE. We have some clear data on this and then some more data that we really are doing research on to try to understand further. And then how as physicians, um, we identify strictures and what techniques that we use. Then I'll go into more of the safety and benefits on dilation of strictures in EOE. And then finally, some discussion on how the dilations are formally completed. And then in summary, some take home points for you and your family. First, some background on EOE. So as we know, it's a chronic allergy condition. It causes narrowing as well as inflammation in the esophagus. And we diagnose it based on symptoms of difficulty swallowing, as well as biopsies of the esophagus that are showing at least 15 eosinophils that are present. I do want everyone to know who's listening, who's either a patient or a patient's family member, that you all are not alone. This condition is really increasing in the United States. It's really up to about one in 2,000 patients. And it's actually the most frequent reason that patients present to the emergency department for a food impaction. That's when food gets stuck and can't be removed by either further swallowing or drinking liquids to get it through into the stomach. And so patients will come to the emergency department and sometimes it will need to be removed with an endoscope to take out the food. This occurs in about 46 to 63% of patients that come with food impaction have an underlying diagnosis of EOE. So it's actually really important to educate physicians and we've been working on this to biopsy the esophagus at the time that patients come for the endoscope through the emergency room so that we can get that diagnosis of EOE right away and then get the patient to the right type of physician to treat it. Unfortunately, at this point, only half or less of patients get biopsies in real time, so we're working on improving that to get the diagnosis sooner. In addition, it's a huge number of patients, almost 95% who are adults or in their late teenage years, who present for an endoscopy with difficulty swallowing or dysphagia that actually have EOE. So in summary from all of this, EOE is very common. We're glad you're here to learn more about it for you and your family. And since it is a newer condition in the grand scheme of medicine, we're doing the best we can to research more about it in order to educate you and treat you further. So next I wanna mention the age of diagnosis. As you can see, there's quite a span here but the most common time frame is typically in the late 30s. However, as you can see, patients who are children will present to pediatric physicians as young as under five. And even we have a decent amount of patients that come to us in their 60s. What's interesting is, although we tend to diagnose this condition in the 30s, a lot of patients will tell us that they've had symptoms for many years but you all may notice that you get very good at, at compensating is what we call it, where you're eating slower, the last person to leave the table after a meal, chewing carefully, eliminating certain foods. So sometimes it takes a while for us to diagnose it since you're so good at trying to compensate and, and improve your symptoms. These are the main risk factors for EOE, primarily in the Caucasian population. In addition, males are three times 
more likely to have EOE. Obviously, we're a large referral center at Mayo for EOE, so we do see a lot of female patients as well. In addition, what's interesting is this allergy pathway that affects the esophagus also affects other areas in the body. So a lot of our patients also have other allergy diseases. These include asthma, allergic rhinitis, as well as eczema. And this can overlap in about 50 to 80% of patients. So we actually work very closely with our allergy colleagues in order to make sure that we're treating EOE, but also treating these other conditions that are related. In addition, my patients often ask me if they have relatives who have EOV, if they're higher risk. So we do know that for patients that have first-degree relatives with EOE, first-degree relative meaning either siblings or parents, so one degree away from the individual, the risk is actually 10 to 64 times that of the average person in the U.S. So that risk does go up. I do have several families that I treat for EOE where I have siblings I'm treating or a parent and a child that I also treat. So how exactly does EOE work? So on this schematic here, you can see we have a drawing of a person, their head's up top here. You can see their nasal passages and their mouth and throat area, and then the food pipe or esophagus is moving downward. And so what happens is initially either airborne allergens or food allergens, and I'll mention those food allergens on the next slide, essentially activate the allergy white blood cell immune system in your body. There's a lot of complex mechanisms of how it works, so I just want to give you a general idea. So once that allergy pathway gets activated, this causes the eosinophils to enter into the esophagus or food pipe, and this is what causes the acute allergic inflammation. Over time, as that allergy pathway is active and inflammation is going on, this leads to the scar tissue or what we call fibrosis in the esophagus, and that's what causes the narrowing. And that's what we'll focus on throughout this talk because of course dilation is, what, is what's used to treat and open that narrowing to give patients relief of symptoms. These are the top six food triggers for EOE. Many of you are probably familiar with these, so this will be a refresher. The most common trigger is dairy. After that is wheat, and then soy and eggs, tree nuts and fish. These are the six most common. There are other ones like corn and legumes, meat. These are much lower risk. The majority of patients have one or two triggers. Some patients do opt to try to identify these triggers. Um, for other patients, we treat in different manners that I'll mention later. Um, but what's nice is at least the majority of patients typically only have one or two triggers because it would be very restricted to have, of course, someone hold all six of these food groups. So we try to identify the top causes. So what exactly does this inflammation mean for you or your family if you have the eosinophils there? So two main things, as I mentioned, one are symptoms and then two narrowing in the esophagus. So in terms of symptoms, the most common ones are food getting caught when swallowing. Heartburn is another common symptom, which can be directly from EOE. Also, there is an overlap where some patients with EOE also have acid reflux and heartburn can be from that. In addition, some of the most troublesome symptoms are food can get stuck for more than five minutes at a time. And sometimes, as I mentioned, this can require emergency department visits. That's what we call a food impaction, where the food needs to be removed by a physician going in with an endoscope and physically taking it out or moving it into the stomach to give the patient relief. The other component is the inflammation over time can cause narrowing. So there's a lot of terms when you see your physician or you're with your family seeing their physician that your doctor may use for this. So sometimes we use the word stricture, sometimes we say stenosis, sometimes we say scarring or scar tissue. Basically, all of this means narrowing in the esophagus. So then the next question becomes, well, who with EOE develops strictures? And so one thing we do know that's pretty clear, because we're trying to study more about this, but the part that we do understand currently is that if EOE goes on for years without being treated, then the narrowing and the strictures develop. So as you can see in this bar graph, so on the bottom here on the x-axis, we have years over time. So you can see on the left, that zero to two years without treatment for EOE, and then all the way over on the right, more than 20 years or more than two decades with EOE that's not treated. These color schematics on the black and gray scale 
show a few different things. So first, the white is showing the proportion of patients that still have a normal esophagus. The light gray area is showing patients that have active inflammation. The darker gray area is showing patients that have active inflammation and fibrosis, meaning scar tissue in there. And then finally, the black part of the diagram is showing the scar tissue. So basically, what we're seeing here is the proportion of patients that have narrowing in the esophagus increases over time. So only about 17% of patients at two years will have significant strictures or narrowing in the esophagus. However, all the way over on the right, after at least 20 years, 71% of patients will have narrowing. So we know over time, narrowing continues to progress and is gonna be present if we're not treating the EOE. Here's another way to look at it in terms of the strictures in EOE. So again, looking at the bottom line of this graph, this is age from zero to 80 years. And what these line charts are showing, you can see the increase in the line over time rising to the top of the chart. So essentially what this represents is every 10 years or every decade, the risk for a patient having the narrowing or stenosis doubles. So time is the main factor, not treating it and time are the two main things that increase narrowing. So then the question becomes, well, why do we get narrowing in the esophagus and EOE? And that's something that we understand some basic principles on, but there's a lot more that we're researching in this area to really try to understand it further. So we'll talk about the general principles that we do understand with current evidence. So if you look at these top panels here, there's four panels. So first here on the left, this is a normal esophagus. So we're looking at it in two ways. One, we're looking at the long pipe system going down to the stomach, and then we're looking down the pipe system towards the stomach, which looks like a circle or a cylinder here. So you can see the circle is quite open. It's a good, healthy, kind of peachy pink color. That's a normal esophagus. However, when we move to the second panel, so this is where inflammation starts because all those eosinophils are starting to hang out in the esophagus like I showed you in that original diagram. As you can see here, the pipe system of the esophagus is red indicating inflammation, and you can see some changing going on. It's not just the nice, healthy, peachy color. You can see some changes, including lines and rings, and I'll show you a little bit further how we categorize those when we do the endoscopic evaluations for patients. And then in the third panel, the inflammation has been hanging out for a while, so scarring is starting to develop. And then finally, in the fourth panel, you can see how narrow the center ring is looking down the esophagus pipe system because there's a lot of scarring after the inflammation that's been going on for a while. As I mentioned, we're studying more to try to understand this process, but this is the general idea. So then more specifically, we know that EOE that's not treated is going to lead to narrowing over time, but then the question becomes, well, what about patients in general? Who's really at risk for strictures? So again, as I mentioned, we're studying more of this, but what we know thus far is most patients are probably at risk for strictures. However, when it will happen is not quite clear. It's pretty patient specific. We know if you're off treatment over those decades, the narrowing can occur, as I mentioned. But sometimes we have patients that present to us immediately who already have some narrowing going on. So it really depends on the patient. In addition, the location of the narrowing can be different depending on the person. So sometimes we have a very specific area that has a narrowing, and sometimes it's really throughout the whole esophagus. So I'll show you some of the ways that we look at trying to identify where the narrowing is or whether it's throughout the esophagus. And then finally, we're starting to research and find some data to try to clarify who is really at greatest risk for narrowing. We know thus far that patients who are in what we call biopsy or histologic remission for EOE, meaning if we biopsy the esophagus and the medicines or diet therapy that they're on shows that the eosinophils are gone or at least under 15, then those patients are probably less likely to develop stricturing. However, we're still trying to understand this further. So next we'll move on to how as physicians do we find these narrowings in the esophagus or strictures? So there's a couple different ways. The first way is what we call barium esophagram. So this is basically a radiology imaging study where patients will drink some liquid barium, which is kind of that white chalky stuff. Thankfully now we flavor it, so it tastes a little bit better for you. 
as well as a barium tablet. It looks just like a pill, but it's made of barium that we can see on the x-ray. And then we measure the width of the esophagus in different spots with our radiology colleagues. So as you can see here on the right, so this may look familiar to some of you if you've seen chest x-rays before. So the head of the patient is up top. You can see the bones up here, the collarbone. Next to the food pipe or esophagus, these are the patient's lungs. You can see some lines going through. That's the ribs and the stomach is at the bottom. This white area is the esophagus or the food pipe. As you can see, there's different measurements on there. So after you drink the barium, the radiologist is able to measure the narrowest width or diameter of the esophagus and the widest. So this essentially gives us as gastroenterologists and esophageal specialists a roadmap so that we know where the narrowings are so we can target those during the endoscopy to dilate them. In addition, we're also looking at following these long-term in patients so that we can see how the narrowings change over time. In addition to radiology imaging, the other ways that we find the narrowings or the strictures are through endoscopy and several techniques. One is through visual inspection, and I'll show you on the next slide some of the ways that we categorize the inflammation and the scarring in the esophagus, since a lot of my patients ask about that from the endoscopy reports. Another way that we do it is through a technique called endoflip. This is kind of an interesting acronym, but it means Functional Lumen Imaging Probe. Funky name, but essentially what it means is we take what looks kind of like a sandwich bag and we fill it with fluid and it has a conductive fluid solution in there and it measures the width of the esophagus. So similar concept to what I just showed you on the esophagram. This is more in research. We're studying how to use this further in patients. So um, I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but it's another way that we try to measure the esophagus. And then in addition, we also get information on scarring through the biopsies. So the gold standard in terms of diagnosing EOE and seeing if EOE is under control is still measuring those eosinophils that we talked about earlier. And if they're above 15, that's considered abnormal. However, we have other things that we can actually see on the biopsies that our pathology colleagues help us with, including we can see some scarring present. It's still on the research phase of how we should use this in the future to guide care for our patients. This was the schematic I was mentioning earlier where we define the features of EOE as well as the narrowing. You may see this in some of your endoscopy reports, or your family's reports. So this is what we call the endoscopic reference score or EREFs. I wanna show you the general principles of this because a lot of my patients see this as we put it in the reports and then they ask us what that means. So I like to review it with them. So this will give you a general guideline in case you have questions on it with your physician. So we look at five different parameters, edema, rings, exudates, furrows, and stricture. So let me describe a little bit of what these mean. So first is edema. That's basically just a fancy word, medical term for swelling. So as you can see here on the panels, they're graded here with the mildest features on the left and then more severe to the right. So if you first look at the swelling one, you can see on grade two here on the right on the third picture that it looks kind of paler and we can't see a lot of red lines in there, meaning the blood vessels. So that's what we call edema or swelling. The next one is a little easier to see. So that's the rings. You can see these rings forming throughout those images there. And you can see how prominent they are on the right side. And then moving down, exudates are basically little white spots or dots that we see. And really what that is, is the eosinophils or those allergy cells basically collect in little groups. And visually it looks like those white spots that you can see there. The next panel down, you can see our furrows. So I like to think of these as railroad tracks. You can see how they're moving down and they're kind of double lined like a railroad crossing. In addition, it kind of looks like a spider web because you see how the rings are going along the lining of the esophagus and then the furrows or train tracks cross those. So it looks a little bit like a spider web as well. And then finally, the focus of this as well for the rest of the talk is we identify if there are strictures present. You can see in the very bottom here, the left versus the right how narrow the circle is on the right. And that's an example of a stricture narrowing in the esophagus. That's what we're targeting when we're talking about dilation. So before I talk about dilation specifically, I wanna guide you in terms of the general overview of how we manage EOE. 
So medical therapy is, of course, outside the topic today. But just to mention that we like to treat EOE with medical therapy to reduce inflammation. There's different types that we use. In addition, it's the scarring or fibrosis that we're really targeting with the dilation. So we use these therapies in combination to help reduce inflammation and fibrosis and improve your symptoms the best that we can. So our general treatment goals for EOE are, as I mentioned, to improve your symptoms, and then also to try to prevent further narrowing or stenosis by controlling inflammation. And then finally, in addition to approving how you're feeling day to day, we also want to prevent complications. So as I mentioned, the number one reason for food impaction presentation now in the U.S. is really EOE. So we want to get the esophagus open to prevent you from having a food impaction or food stuck. And then also to prevent a significant tear in the esophagus that can happen if the food gets stuck. That's what we call a perforation. So now I'll move into specific principles of treating EOE in the setting of dilation. So I'll talk about three different things. One, safety. Two, how well it works or efficacy. And then finally, some discussion on the techniques we use, since a lot of my patients are interested in how we do the dilation, especially when they see it in the reports. So first, safety. This is always really important. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to help your symptoms, help you and your family, but also reduce the risks associated with it. So actually, the most common side effect of dilation of the esophagus in EOE is actually chest pain. In some studies, it's in up to 74% of patients, so that's pretty common. However, most of these patients are ex experiencing a pretty mild soreness in the chest, I always educate my patients before I do a dilation to expect to feel a mild soreness, usually for a couple days or even three days after. Sometimes it'll be even a little bit longer. However, severe sharp stabbing chest pain is very uncommon. So if that occurs, we always recommend patients contact us or come to the emergency department because then there could be a tear that's not expected. So for most patients, there is soreness, it's very tolerable, and it goes away on its own after a few days. In addition, in the studies, they showed that all patients who did have chest pain were agreeable to repeat dilation as needed. And that really seems to be accurate with our clinical practice as well. It's usually very mild and patients understand that it's temporary and it resolves on its own. The next thing we think about is bleeding. This is something we look at for pretty much every procedure that we evaluate in gastroenterology, including dilation for EOE. So the risk of bleeding is quite low at 0.03 to 0.05%. So that's a very low rate. Usually there should be a very small amount of bleeding, just a little bit of drops as we're stretching that scar tissue because then we know we've opened the tissue and then it resolves after that. The other thing that we always think about in gastroenterology, especially with dilations, is the rate of perforation. So when we're dilating, and I'll show you some images in a little bit, we want to make sure that we're opening the very inner lining of the esophagus to open the scar tissue because that's how we're going to get you and your family feeling better. However, we don't want to go all the way through the wall of the esophagus. That's what's called a perforation. And so we have a lot of data now looking at dilations over 2,000 even in, in certain studies. And we see that the rates of perforation are very low, up to about 0.3%. So that's about three in a thousand patients. So overall, that's a very low rate. And in addition, patients are not getting admitted for surgeries to treat the perforation or passing away from the procedure. So that's really important. So overall, we feel that dilation really helps our patients and is safe from that standpoint. So next we'll talk about efficacy or how well do the dilations work? So we have a good amount of data on this as well from several studies, and actually the outcomes are really good. Up to 95% of our patients have reduction in symptoms, meaning difficulty swallowing, and reduction in food impactions because of dilation. So it really does work quite well. In addition, we do have a pretty substantial amount of patients, up to about half, who get relief for a long time after dilation if they're also on appropriate medical therapy. So sometimes patients don't need another dilation for several years. So finally, I wanna talk about technique in EOE and how we dilate patients, how we do it carefully to give you the best benefit we can, but also reduce those risks that I talked about. 
So we use a very conservative approach, meaning we want to increase the width or the diameter of the esophagus in small amounts. So sometimes if the esophagus is very narrowed when we first start dilating, we like to initially do the dilations in multiple treatment sessions so that we can get the patient to a good diameter that will relieve symptoms, but not going too fast or too far. So as I mentioned, we do a small increase in diameter for each session. Our goal is usually to get to the esophagus width of about 15 to 18 millimeters. That's the size that we've seen in studies really helps reduce your symptoms. In addition, we have different techniques that we use. So we use balloons, we use these other long dilators called bougie. So I'll show you those in a second so that we can clarify how we do that. So these are bougie dilators. They're essentially a plastic type dilator that's a long, thin tube. And essentially what we do is we slide the tube through your mouth down into the esophagus or food pipe and then slide it back up to help stretch the area. In between each size that we use, we go back in with our endoscope to look carefully and make sure that we opened up enough, but not too much so that we're doing it very carefully. You may see different names for this in the reports for your endoscopies, and you can ask your doctors any questions specifically about that, but the general term for these tubes are the bougie dilators, but you may see things like American dilator, Maloney, Savory. Those are just different types of the same entity. The other thing you may have seen on some of your reports is we use balloon dilators as well. So with the balloon, it actually goes through the scope. So the scope is in when we're using it. And basically what I'm showing in these pictures, first, if you look at the top left image in A, so this is the esophagus or food pipe, we're looking down it. Um, so the stomach is all the way at the bottom of what you're seeing there, kind of shadows, you can't see it right now. And you can see the rings that we're targeting that are causing the narrowing. And then in B, C, and D, you can see we put the balloon out from the scope. You can see the kind of translucent circle there. And then we, in panel E, we move the scope so that we can see straight through the balloon. The nice part of this technique is while we're dilating, we're looking through the balloon tunnel so that we can see exactly what we're opening so that we do the appropriate amount of dilation or opening. And then finally in panel F, this is what it should look like afterward. I know it looks a little bit scary that there's some blood there, but this is an endoscopy where our panels basically are 30 to 40 times real life. So we make everything really large when we're doing endoscopy so that as the physician, we can see well, but this is a very small tear in terms of real life. It just looks large on the screen. And this is what we want because this is what's opening that scar tissue. So our goal is to do this very carefully, as I said, so we open up enough to give you relief, but not too far to cause a deeper tear. In addition, you may have questions for your local physicians about the balloon dilators versus the tube ones. A lot of it really depends on what the training is for the specific institution you're at. Some may use one or the other or both. At our institution, we use both depending on what type of narrowing we're dealing with. So finally, I wanna show you a picture of what, again, things should look like. So on the left panel here, this is before dilation. You can see the narrowing with those circle rings. And then on the right, you can see that red line up at the top. That means that we opened up the scar tissue appropriately to give you relief. So take home points. As I mentioned, EOE is a chronic disease requiring management over time. Treatments include medical therapy, as I mentioned, and there's a lot of those that will be discussed in other talks through APFED, as well as dilation that we focused on today. And esophageal narrowing worsens without treatment. We know that, as I had mentioned earlier. However, dilation is an effective and safe treatment to help relieve symptoms of difficulty swallowing and help to improve EOE. So it's really important to ask your doctor more information. I hope this is a nice overline summary in, in terms of dilation in EOE and how it may benefit you or your family members. So I encourage you all to speak with your physicians about whether dilation is appropriate for you as well as your family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. We really appreciate you taking the time to go through that and having so many visuals to, to illustrate the points that you've been making. If you all have any questions, now's the time. Go ahead and insert them to the Q&A section, and we're going to start going through the conversation. 
Alrighty. So our first question um, is from, he's self-defining as a 70 year old man who's had EOE for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He said he's symptomatic about every 20 months or so and recently have been negative, but has strictures. He was dilated in February and again in August. And so he's interested about more information about the transition from inflammation to fibrosis and how many times and how often he can be dilated. Yeah, great question. So there's a lot of components to that. So exactly as he had mentioned, great question. There is a component of inflammation as well as scarring that could be involved with these strictures. So what? So these are a few things that you should talk to your doctor about. One is find out, is there active inflammation going on that they need to treat with medical therapy? Meaning on your biopsies, is there an evidence of eosinophils that are above 15 there? Because sometimes just treating active inflammation alone can help open up the narrowing. And I know we didn't cover that in this talk, but they can talk to you further about what type of medical therapy may be needed to target that inflammation if it's there. The other component is that old scarring or that fibrosis that may be there independent of the inflammation. So that's the part we're targeting with the dilations. So basically your doctors will gauge that on two things. One, how are your symptoms doing? So if you're only having symptoms every 20 months, they may not be as aggressive about dilating. The other thing is how, how wide is the esophagus? So they would look back at the numbers of where they dilated you before. And usually our goal is to try to get you above 15, goal even 17, because that's what we have the most data on to show that that will help reduce your symptoms. So in summary, talking to your doctor about is there active inflammation and talk to them about what the measurements on your esophagus are and whether they need to repeat any dilations based on your symptoms. Could you talk a little a bit about treatment for fibrosis other than dilation? So we have a little bit of data on this. We're trying to figure this out more. That's a really good question. So as you may know, EOE is really in its infancy in the grand scheme of medicine. So we've really only understood EOE for really the last 30 years or so. And we've only had guidelines really in the last decade in terms of international guidelines. So what we know thus far is in terms of medical therapy, we think that swallowed topical steroids are the best at trying to reduce the fibrosis and keep the esophagus open. So I tend to err on the side of treating with that when I have patients that come to me for the first time and already have narrowing. So those topical steroids are things like budesonide and fluticasone that you'll either spray and swallow or mix and swallow. Um, we don't have as good of data on diet therapy, proton pump inhibitors for helping with the, the narrowing. So as you look at patients and consider them for dilation, who do you consider like the prime candidates? So the prime candidates are patients who have a lot of difficulty swallowing, are having food impactions or things getting stuck more than five minutes or had to go to the emergency room. And we obtain that barium esophagram, like I showed you, that gives us the roadmap and there's significant narrowing present. Is there a point at which um, dilations are no longer safe? For example, we were talking about the, the 70 year old gentleman. Um, one of the concerns he noted in a follow-up question is what happens when he's 90? Like, can dilations still be done at that point? So we don't have a, a strict cutoff for how many dilations that you can have or what age we should stop at. So it really depends how healthy. We have a lot of patients who are 90-year-olds who are as healthy as a 70-year-old. So if they're very active, they don't have a lot of other medical issues that would prevent sedation for an endoscopy, then we can continue stretching as needed. So it's very patient-dependent. And can you just reiterate for a moment how often you would consider dilating someone? Yeah, so a lot of it depends on the size. So when I have patients that come to me with very narrow diameters in their esophagus, sometimes they come, it's only six millimeters, 10 millimeters, very narrow. Then we're gonna dilate much more often. So it really depends on the initial size. Sometimes we even have to dilate weekly if the patient is really narrowed in the beginning. So it depends on symptoms, initial size, and then how far we dilate on each endoscopy as well. 
As a point of reference, you're talking about that goal to get someone to 15 to 18 millimeters. What is the circumference of a, uh, or the diameter uh, of a normal esophagus for comparison? Yeah, excellent question. So the diameter of a normal esophagus is 20 millimeters or two centimeters, roughly. So our goal is not necessarily to get you to 20. Sometimes we do with EOE, and if we get there, great. But we know if we can at least get you close to that, which is the 17 millimeters or 1.7 centimeters, then we're going to be able to relieve symptoms. Are there any indications that you look for to disqualify someone from dilation? Um, yeah, so basically the, there isn't anything that specifically disqualifies someone from dilation itself, unless they had a recent tear in the esophagus, let's say someone already went to the emergency room because food had been stuck and there was a tear that was deep like a perforation then we don't want to dilate for a while because we want that area to heal. So we'll wait usually a couple months. There isn't a strict guideline on that, but usually a couple months before we want to go in and stretch again. But otherwise, usually it's not related to the dilation itself. It's a matter of, is the patient a candidate for an endoscopy that requires sedation? So we look at other medical issues, things that would make sure that they're safe to do an endoscopy. Makes sense. Um, so we've got a question that came in about the barium esophagram. They're curious about how essential it is before an endoscopy and dilation for someone experiencing dysphagia and not impactions. So it's actually really helpful. We use it on almost all of our EOE patients. Um, what's nice about the barium esophagram is it's an inexpensive, low-risk test, and pretty much every institution can do it. Not every institution has a very specific EOE-based protocol like we do because we develop that especially at Mayo, but every institution can do a general barium esophagram pretty much. It's really widespread. So it gives us a nice roadmap so we know what tools to use and where the narrowings will be. We do have some data in EOE that I'll let you know that as physicians, even esophageal specialists, where we do extra training after our gastroenterology training to dilate these strictures, we're not always the best at visually seeing subtle ones during an endoscopy, and we know that. So we're very open with our patients about that. So that's why we like the esophagrams, because it gives us another tool as a roadmap so we can try to avoid missing any strictures. So the summary of that is it's not mandatory. You can go in with an endoscopy first. However, when it is available, it's quite helpful. Well, this has been such wonderful information today. If anyone has any additional questions, please make sure you're entering them into the Q&A. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Snyder. Are there any questions that haven't been answered that you have like additional remarks you'd like to share? I think, you know, a lot of this is really just making sure you have an open discussion with your physician about dilation. I'm hoping this gives you a general overview so that you can come to your own physicians with educated questions, just like you asked me. And then you can have an open discussion on whether dilation is indicated for you, how often, and kind of what the plan will be moving forward. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and so with, with that, I'm going to take a few minutes to, to thank people for, well, we've got one more question come in before, before yeah, I, I switch ahead. over. Fantastic. All righty. Is there any substitute for the barium pill? Um, sometimes, actually, you can use the barium pill. There are some institutions that have kind of a barium type marshmallow that you can swallow. Um, the barium pill is not mandatory. Some of my patients can't swallow it because their esophagus is just too narrowed at the time. So at minimum, we like to get the measurements with the liquid. But when we can get the pill, it allows us to see if the pill gets held up anywhere along the esophagus with narrowing. And then also if it gets held up at the bottom, kind of where the trap door muscle relaxes into the to the stomach, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for all the, the wonderful information today. We really appreciate your thoughtful answers to all the questions as well. Thank also, you so much. Absolutely. I also wanna thank our education partners for their support of this webinar series. That includes Abbott, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, GSK, Sanofi, and Regeneron. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will also register for future webinars in our series. The next one we have scheduled is on oral immunotherapy and EOE on December 8th, and it's going to feature Dr. Punita Panda from Northwell Health System. 
There are lots of opportunities to continue learning with AtFed about eosinophilic disorders, including our annual patient education conference, EOS Connection. While the live events were held this July, the conference sessions, as well as the research hall and the exhibit hall are still available on demand through the end of the year. I encourage you to check that out. Another great resource is AtFed's podcast. In our latest episode, our co-hosts, Ryan Piansky and Holly Nodowitz, had a wonderful discussion about longitudinal research with Dr. Kara Cleaver. So we encourage you to check out atfed.org slash podcast, as well as subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and other places. If you'd like to have conversations with other people who have these conditions, we encourage you to connect with them through our online community on the Inspire Network. You can head over to atfed.org slash connections to join. So thank you again to everyone for joining us today. And thank you again, Dr. Snyder, for such a wonderful presentation. If anyone has any questions that did not get answered today, please email us at mail at atfed.org. We'll be happy to get answers for them. Hope everyone has a great day.